And now, an ad from Dad. <clears throat> All right, save money on car insurance when you bundle home and auto with Progressive. Can I take these off? All right. What is this? This looks good. Wow. That's well made. Where did you get this? I'm talking to you with the hair. Yeah, where did you get this? It's good stuff. That's solid. That's not veneer. That's solid stuff. Progressive can't save you from becoming your parents, but we can save you money when you bundle home and auto. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company affiliates and other insurers. Discounts not available in all states or situations. This is a download from BFM 89.9, the business station. This is the TED Radio Hour. Each week, groundbreaking TED Talks. TED Talks. Uh, TED. TED. Technology. Entertainment. Design. Design. Is that really what it stands for? I've never known that. Delivered at TED conferences around the world. It's the gift of the human imagination. We've had to believe in impossible things. The true nature of reality beckons from just beyond. Those talks, those ideas, adapted for radio. From NPR. I'm Guy Raz. Coming up... As we age, I think that we are afraid of suffering. Most people do want to live longer. We've got to do something that nobody has today. It's something that you did not think would ever be possible. But it's not inconceivable. Longevity happened to them. So you have to wonder, what will my future be? This episode, The Fountain of Youth. First, the news. It's the TED Radio Hour from NPR. I'm Guy Raz. About a decade ago, writer Dan Buettner went on a quest, a quest for something as old as human history, the fountain of youth. And after traveling all over the world, researching people who live longer than anyone on the planet, often well into their hundreds, Dan may have found it. Beans. The cornerstone of every... Longevity die in the world is beans. Beans? Wow, that's a secret? I argue that if Americans could eat about a cup of beans a day, uh, we'd see a life expectancy of our country go up from two to four years. Wow. Uh, Ounce for ounce as much protein as meat, full of antioxidants, fiber, and they actually set up your gut flora so that healthy bacteria can thrive instead of the bacteria that causes inflammation and obesity. Wow. They're amazing. Yeah. I make a great vegan chili with like five different beans and soy chorizo. It's awesome. I'm I'm, I'm coming over. Yeah, I'm going to make it tonight. Actually, I got navy beans, pinto beans. I got... uh, Okay, so so to be clear, beans alone won't do much for you, but they happen to be one of the common things that people in very specific places around the world tend to eat. Places Dan Buettner calls blue zones. Okinawa, Japan, the highlands of Sardinia, a small island off the coast of Turkey called Ikaria, the Nicoya Peninsula of Costa Rica, and in the United States, the Seventh-day Adventist in Loma Linda, California. People in all these places live longer on average than anyone else on the planet. And so for most of the past decade, Dan's been working with physicians, demographers, and psychologists to try to understand why. Here's Dan's answer from the TED stage. The real secret, I think, lies more in the way that they organize their society. And one of the most salient elements is how they treat older people. You ever notice here in America, social equity seems to peak at about age 24? Uh, Here in Sardinia, the older you get, the more equity you have, the more wisdom you're celebrated for. Uh, You go into the bars in Sardinia, instead of seeing the Sports Illustrated swimsuit calendar, you see the centenarian of the month calendar. Typically in America, we've divided our adult life up into two uh, sections. There's our work life, where we're productive, and then one day, boom, we retire. And typically that has meant retiring to the easy chair or going down to Arizona to to play golf. Uh, In the Okinawan language, there's not even a word for retirement. 
Instead, there's one word that imbues your entire life, and that word is ikigai. And roughly translated, it means the reason for which you wake up in the morning. Now imagine how that idea, that waking up with purpose could be the secret to a longer life, would have sounded just a century ago, when even in the developed world, you were lucky to make it past 50. But since 1900, global life expectancy has doubled, and researchers like Dan Buettner are just beginning to uncover how to push it further. So today on the show, the scientific breakthroughs and the ideas behind how we might all live longer and even better lives. How, in some ways, we're getting closer to the fountain of youth. But the first thing to know is that how long you live, in some ways, says Dan Buettner, is within your control. But if you ask the average American what the optimal formula of longevity is, they probably couldn't tell you. The fact of the matter is there's a lot of confusion around what really helps us live longer better. Should you be running marathons or doing yoga? Should you eat organic meats or should you be eating tofu? When it comes to supplements, should you be taking them? Uh, how about these hormones or resveratrol? And does purpose play into it? Spirituality, and how about how we socialize? Well, the fact of the matter is the best science tells us that the capacity of the human body, my body, your body, is about 90 years. But life expectancy in this country is only 78. So somewhere along the line, we're leaving about 12 good years on the table. These are years that um, we could get. And they, uh, research shows that they would be years largely free of chronic disease, heart disease, cancer, and diabetes. We think uh, the best way to get these missing years is to look at the cultures around the world that are actually experiencing them, areas where people are living to age 100 at rates up to 10 times greater than we are, areas where the life expectancy is an extra dozen years, and the rate of middle-aged mortality is a fraction of what it is in this country. So tell me how you began this process. Like, you sort of started to collect data from around the world and crunch numbers and then honed in on these specific places? Well, I'm an explorer, and I was doing an expedition in Okinawa in 2000, and um, there was this little-known set of islands in South Pacific that had the longest disability-free life expectancy in the world. And I thought, well, there's an interesting mystery to explore. And yeah. I did a real facile exploration. And um, but what did you find when you got there? Essentially a population that's uh, eating mostly a plant-based diet, really strong social networks from an early age. They call them moais, committed social networks. But this was a great discovery. I, as an explorer, to be relevant today, I, I believe you can't just climb Mount Everest again or you know, make it up to the North Pole on cross-country skis or something. You have to find something that adds to the body of knowledge. And this discovery in Okinawa, I just knew it mattered to people, most of whom do want to live longer, at least add the most years to their life. We found our second blue zone about 125 miles off the coast of Italy on the island of Sardinia but only up in the highlands, an area called the Noro province. And this is a place where people not only reach age 100, they do so with extraordinary vigor. Their history actually goes back to about the time of Christ. It's actually a Bronze Age culture that's been isolated. Because the land is so infertile, they're largely uh, shepherds, which occasions regular low-intensity physical activity. Their diet is mostly plant-based, accentuated with foods that they can carry into the fields. They came up with an unleavened whole wheat bread, uh, called nota musica, made out of durum wheat, a type of cheese made from grass-fed animals, so it's high in omega-3 fatty acids instead of omega-6 fatty acids from corn-fed animals, and a type of wine that has three times the level of polyphenols than any known wine in the world. It's called Cananao. Uh, the Sardinians live in vertical houses up and down the stairs. Every trip to the store or to church or to the friend's house occasions a walk. When they do do intentional physical activity, it's things they enjoy. They tend to walk, and they all tend to have a garden. So this is common in, in all the, the blue zones you studied, actually, right? I mean, even 
even the oldest people are still really active and, and retirement is, is just like not a thing. That's right. There's never this sort of artificial punctuation between your useful life and then your life of repose like we see in this country. So grandpa may still work with city council advising the mayor on city patrol. Uh, grandma almost always lives with the uh, granddaughter or, or the daughter where she helps cook the food and take care of the kids and grow the gardens. And because grandma has seen a century of famines and economic downturns and tragedies, she's resilient and she passes that resiliency down to younger generations and betters their chances of survival. So what your research suggests is that a lot of this has to do with Social life, not just like the food you eat or like working out like crazy every day. Actually, it doesn't really have much to do with that at all. Not working out like crazy. The lesson from the Blue Zone tell us that the ideal amount of physical activity is a little more than an hour a day. And some of that strenuous, but for the most part, gentle, low intensity physical activity. Uh, we know that loneliness shaves about five years off of uh, your life expectancy. But most of the things we chase after, supplements and diets, et cetera, and foods that are enriched, they don't do much at all for you when it comes to adding good years of life. So what are the common denominators in these cultures? What are the things that they all do? None of them exercise, at least the way we think of exercise. Instead, they set up their lives so that they're constantly nudged into physical activity. 100-year-old Okinawan women are getting up and down off the ground. They sit on the floor 30 or 40 times a day. They don't have any conveniences. There's not a button to push to do yard work or housework. If they want to mix up a cake, they're doing it by hand. They know how to set up their life in the right way so they have the right outlook. Each of these cultures take time to downshift. The Sardinians pray, the Seventh-day Adventists pray, the Okinawans have this ancestor veneration. There's no longevity diet. Instead, these people drink a little bit every day, not a hard sell to the American population. <laughs> they tend to eat a plant-based diet. Doesn't mean they don't eat meat, but lots of beans and nuts. And then the foundation of all this is how they connect. They put their families first, take care of their children and their aging parents. And the biggest thing here is they also belong to the right tribe. They were either born into or they proactively surrounded themselves with the right people. We know from the Framingham studies that if your three best friends are obese, there's a 50% better chance that you'll be overweight. Instead, if, you're, if your friend's idea of, of recreation is physical activity, if your friends drink a little but not too much, and they eat right, and they're engaged, and they're trusting and trustworthy, that is going to have the biggest impact over time. How do the people who live in the Blue Zones think about their lives differently? Because they don't, like, they didn't know that they lived in Blue Zones until you told them that, right? Like, they didn't, like, no. they were just, like, living their lives. They're like, hey, what are you doing here? And we're like, you're like, I'm, you're in a Blue Zone. And they're like, what? I'm living in Sardinia. None of them ever tried to live to be 100. They have no idea how they're living so long. Uh, none of them said at age 50, well, go darn it, I'm going to get on that longevity yeah. diet. Or none of them started doing push-ups or getting supplements. Longevity happened to them. It was a residue of, of their culture. Dan Butner is now helping communities around the U.S. come up with their own Blue Zone projects, like building more sidewalks and bike lanes in L.A. He's planting 46 community gardens in Minnesota. He's even helped towns in Iowa restrict convenience stores around schools. So they don't have easy access to um, junk food. So the whole state of Iowa, the pork state, is becoming a blue zone. Hmm. Well, you can always make pork and beans. <laughs> That's the best one I've heard in a long time. Coming up, a man who thinks of aging as a disease, a disease that could be cured. I'm Guy Raz, and you're listening to the TED Radio Hour from NPR.
It's the TED Radio Hour from NPR. I'm Guy Raz. And on the show today, the fountain of youth, the science and the ideas behind the quest to keep us living long and youthful lives. And we just heard from Dan Buettner. He's an explorer and a researcher who studies blue zones. These are the areas of the world where people live much longer than anywhere in the world. Well, let me stop you right there. How much? How much? It's very important to look at the numbers here. Aubrey de Grey would argue the handful of extra years you can get from, say, a blue zone lifestyle is really pretty minor. People often laugh at the USA on this kind of thing because the USA spends far more money per capita on health care than any other country in the world. Right. And yet if you look at the league table of life expectancy, it comes down in the 40s somewhere, like 45 or whatever. But then if you look at the actual absolute numbers, the difference in lifespan between the USA and the number one country, Japan, guess what it is? Mm. Just guess. Go on. I don't know. Four years, five years. It is indeed. Only four years. Hmm. So, you know, and, and these blue zones, you know, they might get another couple of years. But, um, you know, the numbers are so small that we've got to do something that nobody has today. Aubrey is an evangelist, probably one of the loudest voices for what might be described as the anti-aging movement. He's one of the leaders of a group called the SENS Foundation. It funds research into what he calls rejuvenation biotechnologies. Which means new medicines that don't yet exist that will be able to repair the various types of molecular and cellular damage that the body does to itself throughout life and that eventually contribute to the ill health of old age. Aubrey basically looks at the human body in the same way he sees any other machine. You keep it oiled, you replace parts, you do preventative maintenance, and the machine can keep going a lot longer than it was ever meant to. So instead of just focusing on, say, a cure for cancer, he wants researchers to channel their energy into finding ways to prevent cancer and other diseases from ever developing in the human body in the first place. And he thinks if we could do that... Basically, the types of thing you could die of at the age of 100 or 200 would be exactly the same as the types of things that you might die of at the age of 20 or 30. Huh. An accident, for example. Exactly. Aubrey Gray is a Cambridge-educated biologist, and we should just say at the outset that he does have a fair number of critics in the scientific community, many of whom say the science he's pushing is a little out there. But the idea behind that science is worth considering. It's the idea that we should see aging less as a fact of life and more like a chronic disease, one that we could do a lot more to manage. I mean, I'm not saying that it's not good to do to live a good lifestyle and, and, and to maximize what we can do today. Of course it's good, but it's really only a tiny increase that one can get. Here's more from Aubrey de Grey speaking on the TED stage. Please raise your hand if you want to get Alzheimer's disease. <laughs> Please raise your hand if you think there is some age at which you will want to get Alzheimer's disease. <laughs> Pretty much nobody wants to get sick, however long ago they happen to have been born. And therefore, it's really pretty bizarre that we don't put more effort into stopping people from getting sick, into trying to figure out how medically to alleviate the risk of getting sick as we get older. But that's how things are. And yet, what we have here now is, since we've pretty much got rid of the infectious diseases as a cause of death in the industrialized world, about 90% of all medical care and all death is caused by the diseases of old age. These are universal, these diseases. Some people think, well, some people get Alzheimer's, some people get tuberculosis, it's all much the same thing. Nonsense. Everybody gets Alzheimer's if they don't get anything else. It's not something that you can just avoid by being careful. Alzheimer's, dementia, cancer, these diseases occur because as you age, your body gets damaged. Molecules get damaged, cells mutate, junk accumulates in your body. All of this is natural. It happens to everyone. And Aubrey believes that that damage can be grouped into seven different categories, all of which could be prevented or at least slowed down. So for illustration, let me just talk about one category. Sure. Um, cell loss. What is cell loss? It's simply cells in a particular organ or tissue dying and not being automatically replaced by the division of other cells. 
Now it turns out that that is actually an important contributor to certain aspects of ageing. Parkinson's disease, for example. Now the thing is, we know what the fix for that one is. We know that the right way to repair that kind of damage is stem cell therapy. Hmm. Now, progress in that um, area has been patchy over the past 20 years that people have been thinking about this, but now it's going really well. There are a couple of clinical trials going on, and I'm really optimistic. I think most people are very optimistic. I would say that we've got a very good chance of actually totally curing Parkinson's disease with stem cells in the next 10 years even. Wow. That's one of the easier ones. A lot of the aspects of aging that we need to fix, however, are a lot harder. Hmm. And I think, you know, we might be talking 20 or 25 years. And that's largely because they're less well understood. I mean, you're saying that within 20 or 25 years, we can solve significant parts of of the aging process, we can actually... I would go a bit further than that. I would say that we can probably bring aging under comprehensive medical control within 20 or 25 years. I mean, if, and of if, course, I do, yeah. want to, I do want to introduce, before, before, before you go on, I do want to make sure that I get my caveats in. Yeah. First of all, I'm only saying probably. I'm saying we have at least a 50-50 chance of getting there in that time. I recognize that any prediction one makes about time frames for anything that's more than even a couple of years away is extremely speculative. The other caveat that I definitely want to get in right now is, at the moment, we're probably going three times more slowly than we could be going just because there's so little funding available for this critical work. So I think it's all about this. I think it's that aging is so horrible, so scary, that we have found it necessary to put it out of our minds and pretend that it's not horrible at all. And it doesn't matter how we do that, so long as we can, so long as we succeed in tricking ourselves into the idea that aging is a good thing, even though it doesn't look like a good thing. That made perfect sense. It was a rational thing to do until very recently. Because until very recently, nobody had any idea what to do about aging. But now we do. Now we are within a reasonable distance, within striking distance, of developing medicine that really brings aging under the same level of medical control that we have already today for most infectious diseases, like, you know, tuberculosis or whatever. It's like this. People will refuse to think about whether it's actually a good idea to defeat aging, because they say, well, it doesn't really matter whether it's a good idea or not, does it? Because we're never going to do it. But the same people, at the same time, will also say that we'll refuse to think about whether it's actually likely that we could do anything about aging anytime soon, because who cares, because it's a bad idea, right? So the pessimism about the desirability and the pessimism about the feasibility join together to perpetuate each other. Aubrey's foundation, SENS, has a yearly budget of about $4 million, which is not a lot of money in the world of medical research. And it's why you can find so many talks and interviews with Aubrey online. He is nothing if not tenacious. But what's interesting is that for a 52-year-old guy who spends so much of his time talking about extending life, he says he really doesn't think about the end of his own. I really don't. I'm too busy. This doesn't, it's not something that you're worried about. I, I'm not a worrier. I'm yeah. just not that kind of guy. I'm, yeah. a, I'm, a, I'm a practical guy. I like to get things done. I like to make a difference. Yeah. Do you think that, I mean, if in, in a world where people didn't die or didn't die as quickly, that, you know, the sort of, the I don't know, like... But there would be, be some kind of cultural ossification. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, well it's a, I mean, it's a fair question. But honestly... It's not the kind of question that keeps me up at night. Because right. really, you know, first of all, even if we did have a problem like that, that's the kind of problem I'd like to have. <laughs> Can one really seriously say that it's as serious as this horrible curse that generally is preceded by this long period of decrepitude and disease and decline and dependence and general misery? You know, it's crazy to think that way. People have just got to get their heads together and have a sense of proportion. But you're arguing that the right investment in certain scientific research couldn't just get us to 100 or 110, but it could get us to 110 playing tennis. That's exactly right. In fact, keeping up with your granddaughter on the dance floor. Is that going to happen? 
Well, I've told you it would. You, you, sound, you sound as though you don't quite believe I me. Do, I do, but you can understand why it's still, today, in 2015, sounds like science fiction, right? Things that are only, have only a 50% chance of happening in 20 years from now are supposed to sound like science fiction. <laughs> Aubrey de Grey, you can learn more about his SENS Research Foundation or see several of his talks at TED.com. So forget science fiction. Forget 20 years from now. Cynthia Kenyon is already there. It was absolutely thrilling. I mean, unbelievable. I mean, it still makes my hair stand up just thinking about it. Cynthia is a molecular geneticist. She studies the biology of aging. It's something that you did not think would ever be possible. You would just get this feeling like you're looking into something that, um, who knew was there. And I still feel that way. It's an amazing feeling. She's talking about a breakthrough in her lab, something she found in an unlikely specimen, a breakthrough that could change how long we humans live. Here's how Cynthia Kenyon explained it in her TED Talk. Have you ever wanted to stay young a little longer and put off aging? This is a dream of the ages. But scientists have for a long time thought this was just never going to be possible. They thought, you know, you just wear out. There's nothing you can do about it, kind of like an old shoe. But if you look in nature... You see that different kinds of animals can have really different lifespans. Now these animals are different from one another because they have different genes. So that suggests that somewhere in these genes, somewhere in the DNA, are genes for aging, genes that allow them to have different lifespans. So if there are genes like that, then you can imagine that if you could change one of the genes in an experiment, an aging gene, maybe you could slow down aging and extend lifespan. And if you could do that, then you could find the genes for aging. And if they exist and you can find them, then maybe one could eventually do something about it. So Cynthia decided to try. And of all the species to answer these questions, she started with worms, a very strange sounding worm. Cinerabditis elegans, or C. elegans. And they're beautiful. They're shaped like little horses' tails. But they're tiny. They're about the size of a comma. A comma. A comma, in a sentence. Yeah, very, very small. But they're really neat. They're cheap. You can grow lots of them. They have a very short lifespan. They only live a few weeks. But they get old. So that makes them very, very uh, practical for scientific studies of aging. And what Cynthia and other researchers did with these worms is nothing short of amazing. Because by changing a single gene, it's called the DAF2, the C. elegans ended up living twice as long, and that was just the beginning. First, we doubled their lifespan. Then we extended it by sixfold. And then another lab was able to extend the lifespan for 10 times as long. The normal average lifespan of a worm is 18 days. And these worms were 144 days old. Wow. Okay, so they were more, just almost 10 times as long as the average lifespan of a normal worm. In just two weeks, the normal worms are old. You can see the little head moving down at the bottom there, but everything else is just lying there. The animal's clearly in the nursing home. And if you look at the tissues of the animal, they're starting to deteriorate. You know, even if you've never seen one of these little C. elegans, which probably most of you haven't seen one, you can tell they're old. Isn't that interesting? So there's something about aging that's kind of universal. And now here is the DAF2 mutant. One gene has changed out of 20,000. It's the same age, but it's, it's not in the nursing home. 
It's going skiing. <laughs> so it's aging, actually. This is what's really cool. It's aging more slowly. It takes this worm two days to age as much as the normal worm ages in one day. And when I tell people about this, they tend to think of maybe an, a 90 or 80 or 90-year-old person who looks really good for being 90 or 80. But it's really more like this. Suppose you're, let's say you're a 30-year-old guy, or 30, in your 30s, and you're, um, you're a bachelor, and you're dating people, and you meet someone that you really like, you get to know her, and you're in a restaurant, and you say, well, how old are you? She says, I'm 60. That's what it's like. And you would never know. You would never know until she told you. You would think to extend the lifespan of an animal for such a long time, you know, you'd have to kind of go around in a, in a way and, and fix things or shore them up. You'd have to do something for the skin and something for the intestine, yeah. something for the nervous system. You'd have to, it would be really hard because old tissues all look old, but they all have their own separate problems. But what's the big surprise is that there are these systemic or system-wide control circuits that you can tap into. And what happens is that there are circulating factors, factors in, in the blood, that can move through the animal and tell the, all the tissues to slow down their aging. Not to slow down their movement, but to slow down their aging. The great secret of all this is that you know, all animals are much more similar to one another than they are different. Worms have muscles, they have nerve cells, they have serotonin, they have acetylcholine, they have all the neurotransmitters we have, the very same ones. So what that means is you can easily interrogate the genome by making mutations to find genes that control things, things that you didn't even know were controlled, like aging. Yeah. And there are actually hints that, that gene changes in humans that mimic the effects of these changes in animals may contribute to exceptional longevity, to becoming a centenarian in a human. So after we found, made our discoveries with little C. elegans, people who worked on other kinds of animals started asking if we make the same DAF2 mutation in other animals, will they live longer? And that is the case in flies. If you change this hormone pathway in flies, they live longer, and also in mice. And mice are mammals like us. So it's an ancient pathway because it must have arisen a long time ago in evolution, so the touch that it still works in all these animals. And they also, the common precursor, also gave rise to people. So maybe it's working in people the same way. So for example, there's one study that was done in a population of Ashkenazi Jews in New York City. And just like any population, most of the people you know, will live to about 70 or 80, but some live to be 90 or 100. And what they found was that there were people who lived to 90 or 100 were more likely to have DAF2 mutations. It's so interesting because, you know, the whole idea of a, of a fountain of youth is so steeped in human mythology, like, like you know, these mythical fountains that people would go and, and, and drink from. But it actually seems like, I don't know, like we might actually be getting closer to that. I think so. And I think to great benefit, I think so, particularly because of this link between natural aging, which is a way bigger risk factor for, for example, cancer than smoking is. I mean, it's huge. Aging is such a risk factor. If we could, you know, slow it down, then we should be able to counteract all these diseases. And those, I mean, they, those worms did have a terrifically wonderful health span as well as lifespan. So we see it. So we know it can happen in these animals. Whether it can happen in, in, in people, we, we just don't know. But what I do think is that we can harness our body's own abilities that are kind of kept under wraps to allow the aging process to be slowed down. And, and that's the hope, is that we can do it in a way that counteracts lots of diseases and, and keeps us healthy right until the end. Cynthia Kenyon studies the biology of aging. You can see her entire talk at ted.npr.org. In a moment, could we evolve into a disease-free species? I'm Guy Raz, and this is the TED Radio Hour from NPR. Thank you. 
It's the TED Radio Hour from NPR. I'm Guy Raz. Our show today is about one of the things that humans have been searching for since the beginning of recorded history, the fountain of youth. Suppose I said that with just a few changes in your genes, you could get a better memory, more precise, more accurate, and quicker. Or maybe you'd like to be more fit, stronger, with more stamina. How about living longer with good health? This is Harvey Feinberg speaking on the TED stage. He's a physician and a medical ethicist and the former dean of Harvard's medical school. Which would you like if you could have just one? How many would opt for memory? How about fitness? What about longevity? Ah, the majority, that makes me feel very good as a doctor. If you could have any one of these, it would be a very different world. All the hands went up when you asked that question. Yeah. Everybody wants to live longer. Most people do want to live longer. Yeah. But we want to live longer, healthier. You know, we have a chronological age, and we have a psychological age, and we have a physical age, which is how many years compared to the average person are you in your state of health at a given age? We can't do anything about the chronological age. That's the passage of time. Yeah. We can do something about the psychological age and the physical age, how we live, what we eat, whether we exercise regularly. Those are the choices that are within our power today. That's today, and many of us do make those choices. But Harvey Feinberg has researched an entirely new world of choices we might someday have, choices that might change how long we live and even how future humans evolve evolution does not necessarily favor the longest lived or the strongest or the fastest and not even the smartest. Evolution favors those creatures best adapted to their environment. So as we think about the place again of humans in evolution, I would say that there are a number of possibilities. The first is that we will not evolve. A second possibility is that there will be evolution of the traditional kind, natural, imposed by the forces of nature. But there's a third possibility, an enticing, intriguing, and frightening possibility. I call it neo-evolution, the new evolution that is not simply natural, but guided and chosen by us. What if you could make the genetic changes to eliminate diabetes or Alzheimer's or reduce the risk of cancer or eliminate stroke? Wouldn't you want to make those changes in your genes? If we look ahead, these kind of changes are going to be increasingly possible. Harvey Feinberg's idea is that the kinds of changes Cynthia Kenyon made in those tiny little C. elegans will one day be common in humans, that eventually we'll be able to edit human genes, splice parts in, take things out, but not just in a gene that might help us live longer, but in all kinds of specific genes that make some of us more susceptible to certain diseases. Just a year ago, mice that were specially bred to have a gene defect that was analogous to muscular dystrophy were treated in embryo form, and the mice that grew up were much less likely to have the expression of muscular dystrophy. That suggests that this technology may become a way to treat human disease or to prevent human genetic disease. I mean, so could that also prevent the diseases of aging? Like, were things like cancer or Alzheimer's might one day seem like like diseases of the 19th century, like scarlet fever or, or smallpox. We think of many diseases as natural phenomena. Right. Infection is natural, but it's avoidable, whether it's a vaccine today or a gene edit in 100 years from today. Wow. And imagine a, a world where you're walking on the street and you just can't tell if someone is 80 or 180 years of age. I mean, that's, that's crazy. I don't think it's crazy. It's unlikely in the near term, but <laughs> right. it's not inconceivable. 
Imagine then just two other little changes. You can change the cells in your body, but what if you could change the cells in your offspring? Eliminate the diabetes, eliminate the hemophilia, reduce the risk of cancer. Who doesn't want healthier children? And then that same analytic technology, that same engine of science that can produce the changes to prevent disease will also enable us to adopt super attributes. That better memory, why not have the quick wit? Why not have the quick twitch muscle that will enable you to run faster and longer? Why not live longer? And when we are at a position where we can pass it on to the next generation and we can adopt the attributes we want, we will have converted old-style evolution into neo-evolution. We'll take a process that normally might require 100,000 years and we can compress it down to 1,000 years and maybe even in the next 100 years. I mean, of course, this raises a ton of ethical questions, right? Absolutely. I mean, like you're talking about a future where we create people who have certain genetic advantages. We can try to anticipate the ethical questions with technologies, but we're better usually at trying to deal with them when they are tangible and real. Any of these tools is going to be powerful enough that it would also be subject to misuse and inappropriate use. So it's very important in my mind that it be used under very strict control and legal and ethical conditions. But we won't be able to undo new knowledge. When we have that knowledge and we have problems that we're trying to fix, we will have tremendous desire to fix those problems. These are choices that your grandchildren or their grandchildren are going to have before them. Will we use these choices to make a society that is better? Or will we selectively choose different attributes that we want for some of us and not for others of us? Will we make a society that is more boring and more uniform or more robust and more versatile? These are the kinds of questions that we will have to face. And most profoundly of all, will we ever be able to develop the wisdom and to inherit the wisdom that we'll need to make these choices wisely, for better or worse, and sooner than you may think, these choices will be up to us. Thank you. Harvey Feinberg is a physician and a medical ethicist. He's also the former dean of the Harvard Medical School and now the president of the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation in Palo Alto. So far on the show, we've heard pretty amazing ideas about how we might postpone aging, how in the future we might all live to be 150. But all of this does raise the question. And what's wrong with aging? Well, that's the question. I mean, everyone we've sort of kind of heard from is they want to fight it. They're fighting it. Well, I think what they are trying to fight is the symptoms, but aging is going to happen anyhow. Is that something that we just need to get better about accepting? Absolutely. Well, do we have an alternative? <laughs> <laughs> oh, before I forget, can you introduce yourself, please? Yes, my name is Isabel Allende, and I'm a writer. Well, a sort of writer. Yeah, well, more than a sort of writer, you're a writer. <laughs> Well, a storyteller. <laughs> Isabel's a celebrated storyteller, recipient of the Presidential Medal of Freedom, author of more than 20 books and novels. And now, in her early 70s, Isabel Allende has been thinking and writing a lot about getting older. When you see other people your age, do you think, I'm the same age as them, or do you think, oh, they're, they're older than me? No, I think we are the same age, and I look so much better. <laughs> But, of course, it takes discipline and money. But also, you know what it takes? Hmm. An attitude. An attitude of conquering the world, of being passionate about things. And that attitude, that is Isabel Allende's fountain of youth. Here she is on the TED stage. 
When do we start aging? Society decides when we are old, usually around 65, when we get Medicare. But we really start aging at birth. We're aging right now, and we all experience it differently. We all feel younger than our real age, because the spirit never ages. I am still 17. Mary Oliver says in one of her poems, tell me, what is it that you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Me, I intend to live passionately. So how can I stay passionate? I cannot will myself to be passionate at 71. I have been training for some time. And when I feel flat and bored, I fake it. Attitude, attitude. How do I train? I train by saying yes to whatever comes my way. Drama, comedy, tragedy, love, death, losses. Yes to life. And I train by trying to stay in love. It doesn't always work, but you cannot blame me for trying. I think that when we are young, we feel that we own the world. And as life starts to push us to the margins, we lose that feeling. Hmm. If we could keep it, older age would be much more fun. Well, why do we lose that feeling? Because you are pushed out. Suddenly you become invisible, especially women. If you look for a job, your age is a problem. If you look for a partner, your age is a problem too. Uh, if I had to put an ad in Match.com, what would I say? Short Latino grandmother looks for a lover? Give me a break. I wouldn't get a match like that. You could like say, that. like, looking for magical, <laughs> realist relationship. <laughs> that would be nice. Yeah, right? Yeah. But, but I mean, when you, you spoke about this, it was really refreshing because you're sort of saying, well, we are all going to age, and we should just kind of accept it and make the best of it and understand that it can still be wonderful. Is that how you feel? Yes. I feel that way now. I don't know how I will feel in 20 years because my mother is 95, hmm. and my mother has the brain of a 30-year-old person, but the body doesn't comply, doesn't accompany her in what she wants to do. My stepfather is 99, wow. and he's healthy, but his brain is gone. So you have to wonder, what will my future be? But right now, I feel full of ideas. Uh, I want to write. I want to do things. I feel curious. I'm passionate about chocolate and wine and cheese and my dogs and, and my wonderful bed and my garden and the bay, when I look at the bay from my window. So I, I am engaged in life right now. Um, also be open to suffering, to pain, to discomfort. As we age, I think that we, we are afraid of suffering. And how can you live? If you avoid suffering, then you are avoiding joy also. What have I lost in the last decades? People, of course, places, and the boundless energy of my youth. And I'm beginning to lose independence, and that scares me. What have I gained? Freedom. I don't have to prove anything anymore. I'm not stuck in the idea of who I was, who I want to be, or what other people expect me to be. I don't have to please men anymore. Only animals. I feel lighter. I don't carry grudges, ambition, vanity. It's great to let go. I should have started sooner. And I also feel softer because I'm not scared of being um, vulnerable. I don't see it as weakness anymore. And I've gained spirituality. I'm aware that before, death was in the neighborhood. Now, it's next door or in my house. What do you wish that the younger you knew about, uh, about getting older? I wish that the younger me would have known that it is an inexorable, unavoidable process, that nothing can stop it. 
and that I have to enjoy the body I have at that moment. I've always wanted to be different. I wanted to be a tall blonde with long legs. <laughs> now, how do you achieve that <laughs> if you're a Latino woman? It's, it's impossible. And I know that in 10 years, I will look at pictures of me now, and I will say, wow, she looked pretty good for her age. I'm never going to look better than now, exactly. this very moment, yeah. never. It just seems like state of mind is so important. Well, I think it's very important. I try to appear in front of everybody else as a very healthy and strong person. And that helps me b believe that I am that. For example, my mother is a whiner. She's all the time, she's all the time in pain. So we always had the idea that my mother was this very frail, ill person that would not live long. She's strong as a bull. <laughs> but the, the, what she projects and what she thinks of herself is frailty. Well, I don't want to be like that. I want to be strong and tough. On a final note, retirement in Spanish is jubilación, jubilation, celebration. We have paid our dues, we have contributed to society, now it's our time, and it's a great time. Unless you are ill or very poor, you have choices. I have chosen to stay passionate, engaged, with an open heart. I'm working on it every day. Want to join me? Writer Isabel Allende, she's coming out with a new book about elderly people and romance. It's called The Japanese Lover. The moon has a few new wrinkles. He shines a bit more silver now than gold. I'm staying young. I'm staying young. Everyone around me is growing old. Thanks for listening to our show about the Fountain of Youth this week. Our production staff here at NPR includes Jeff Rogers, Brent Bachman, Megan Kane, Neva Grant, and Janae West, with help from Barton Girdwood, Daniel Shukin, and Eric Newsom. Our partners at TED are Chris Anderson, June Cohen, Darren Triff, and Janet Lee. I'm Guy Raz, and you've been listening to Ideas Worth Spreading on the TED Radio Hour. From NPR. Thank you for listening to this podcast. To find more great interviews, go to bfm.my or find us on iTunes. BFM 89.9, the business station. Hi, it's Jamie, progressive number one, number two employee. Leave a message at the. Hey, Jamie, it's me, Jamie. This is your daily pep talk. I know it's been rough going ever since people found out about your acapella group, Mad Harmony, but you will bounce back. I mean, you're the guy always helping people find coverage options with the Name Your Price tool. It should be you giving me the pep talk. Now get out there, hit that high note, and take Mad Harmony all the way to nationals this year! Sorry, this is pitchy. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law.